Hello, this is Dr. Mateki back for part two of chapter five. So in this video, which should be a little bit shorter than the first one, we're going to talk about expected inflation and a little bit more sophisticated uh, definition of money demand. And then we're going to finish up by talking about the classical dichotomy. The first thing to notice is that there are actually two different real interest rates, what we call the ex ante real interest rate and the ex post real interest rate. So to understand these two terms, we have to know the difference between actual inflation and expected inflation. So actual inflation is what actually happens with the price level. We don't know what happens to the price level until it happens. So right. So this is something that's um, uh, backwards looking, right? So after the fact, we can go back and look at the data and see how much prices actually rose after we do some research. But that doesn't help decision makers make decisions about the current moment or about the future. So when individuals and firms are making decisions, they actually base their decisions on something called the expected inflation rate, what we think inflation will be in the future. So that leads us to two different definitions of the real interest rate. So there's the ex ante real interest rate is the interest rate that people expect at the time that they engage in some sort of economic activity, whether it's taking out a loan, investing in a project, uh, investing in the stock or bond market, uh, market, etc. So the ex ante real interest rate is what we get when we take the nominal interest rate and subtract expected inflation. The ex post real interest rate is what we often uh, see, see graphed in our time series graphs because that's what actually happens. So we go back and, and do the actual measurements and see what happened to prices and then subtract uh, the rate of inflation from the nominal interest rate. So remember we talked about the relationship between velocity and um, money demand in the quantity theory. And the only thing that uh, money demand depended on was the real income, y. So we just saved a fraction, or excuse me, we just uh, demanded a fraction k of our income uh, be held as money. But that's not realistic because the nominal interest rate, i, plays a key role in money demand. So if the nominal interest rate is high, there's a large opportunity cost of holding your money. So in other words, if you hang on to your money, keep it under the mattress, you're not earning interest on that money. You could put it in the bank and earn the nominal interest rate. So uh, if the nominal interest rate is high, you're foregoing a lot of interest income if you hold lots of money. So the higher the nominal interest rate, the less money you want to hold. The lower the nominal interest rate, the more money you want to hold all else equal. So that means that there is this negative relationship between money demand and the nominal interest rate. I goes up, money demand goes down. And so this leads us to that more sophisticated uh, version of money demand that I alluded to. So what we say now is that money demand, uh, real uh, demand for real money balances, keep in mind, so M divided by P is real money balances, D is demand. So the demand for real money balances is a function L of two variables, the nominal interest rate and income. L just comes from uh, the term liquidity, money is liquid. Um, so this is a general functional form. So when you're solving problems, you'll actually have to you know, be given, a, a, an, in most cases anyway, you'd be given a, a, an explicit function that relates um, the nominal interest rate and income to money demand. So it, uh, the way that these variables are related, so remember I is inversely related, so I goes up, left-hand side goes down, related positively to income. So if income is higher, we're, we're going to buy more stuff, so we need more money. So Y goes up, demand goes up. So negative relationship between I and money demand and a positive relationship between Y and money demand. So when households are making decisions, though, right, they don't know what the rate of inflation is going to be, so they don't really know what the nominal interest rate is going to be uh, in the future when when these these decisions uh, are, are impacting them. So what we should do is break this down a little further. Instead, substitute um, the definition of nominal interest rate in for I, taking care to note that the expected inflation rate is the relevant inflation rate when we're making forward-looking decisions. Right, so when we're making decisions about how much money to hold, the rate of inflation is relevant. The only 
the rate of inflation that we can use to make our decisions about the future are the, is the expected inflation rate. So now that we have this more sophisticated um, formulation for money demand on the right-hand side of, uh, of this equation here, let's see how this impacts our notion of how the price level is determined. So in order to put all these pieces together, we need to have an expression that relates money supply, the price level, and money demand, all of these pieces together. So, with, so the way that we're going to do that is recognize that markets tend to end up in equilibrium in the long run so that you know prices adjust so that supply and demand uh, are equated. So this is no different. So what we're going to do is put the supply of real money balances on the left-hand side. So remember, M is determined by the Federal Reserve. This is the money supply. P is the price level. M divided by P is the supply of real money balances. The expression on the right-hand side is what we've just developed for the demand for real money balances. So we set M over P is equal to L of R plus E pi and Y, and we have our equilibrium condition. At this point, it's useful to talk about each of these different pieces and think again about where these are being determined and where it's coming from uh, to help us understand how one piece of the puzzle is going to move in response to something else changing. So the idea is to have a good understanding of how all the pieces fit together so that we can make predictions about what's going to happen to the price level when something changes. Um, so let's take a look at each of these things. So the M, right, so this stands for the money supply. So this is an exogenous variable that's determined by the Federal Reserve. So they have their... Um, you know, their, their decision-making process and their policies that they're trying to follow and they set M accordingly. So when we talk about the short run later on in the semester, we're going we're gonna to see how the Fed um, intentionally manipulates M to achieve some short run uh, policy goals. The real interest rate is determined in the market for the loanable, for, mo for loanable funds, remember. So it adjusts to ensure that the supply of loanable funds is equal to the demand for loanable funds, which comes from investment. So S equals I. GDP, I don't know where this thing came from. This is a mistake in the slides. So GDP in the long run, how is this determined? Remember, right? Y is equal to F of K and L. And so in the long run, in this model, we've been simplifying this and saying that we're assuming that K and L are fixed. So if the inputs are fixed, then the output is also going to be fixed. So uh, output is determined by the production function in the long run. And so the price is going to be the thing that, that adjusts to make sure all of this fits together. So um, later on in the semester when we talk about the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, we'll see if this is more explicit, but the price level is going to adjust to ensure that um, aggregate demand, the demand for output goods and services is equal to the supply, the aggregate supply of goods and services. Um, and then the nominal interest rate, um, it, once we have determined R, and consumers have determined their inflation expectations and the nominal interest rate is just the sum of these two things. Uh, and again, so this, this expected inflation, where does this come from? Well, this is, you know, these are, these are beliefs that people and, and businesses are forming based on um, what the Fed has done in the past, what they're currently doing, and what they think they will do in the future. So the interesting thing is that now there's this, there's this feedback between these two things. So ex expected inflation uh, is going to be impacted by what happens with the money supply. Okay, so if the money supply goes up, uh, then that can change consumers' expectations about what they think inflation is going to be in the future, right? And so um, uh, expected inflation then affects the nominal interest rate, which affects the entire money demand function. You know, so the, all of these things are sort of feeding into one another. So look at figure 5-5 uh, in your text to, to see a uh, sort of flow chart that shows this, uh, this feedback loop that, that is introduced by uh, the presence of the nominal interest rate in the money demand function. Generally speaking, expectations play a large role in mac macroeconomic models and logic and how we think about things. And this is no different, and we, we're going to see here that the, uh, the price level is actually influenced by expectations. It's not just what's happening today. It's, it's, it's influenced by what we think is going to happen in the future. 
So let's see how the price level responds to a, a change in M, first of all, change in the money supply. But then let's also look at what happens when some of these other variables change. So if we are assuming that the real interest rate and, and output income and expected inflation are all staying the same, in other words, for given values of these things, right? It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy to see what happens because a change in M is going to have to be accompanied by an equivalent change in price level. Otherwise, the equilibrium condition is not holding. So if R, E, pi, and Y are all assumed to be uh, set at some number for a given va value of these things, the right-hand side is, is not changing, right? It's, this is just some fixed number. So if M goes up, then P is going to have to go up to ensure that the left-hand side and the right-hand side, that money supply and money demand uh, are equivalent. However, um, that's not the way it works in real life, right? So the left and right-hand side influence one another. Um, so changes in the money supply can influence expected inflation. So uh, if M goes up, then expected inflation could go up as well. Um, and they don't necessarily have to be in proportion to one another as well, either, right? So expectations are built on a number of, uh, of things, not just some formulaic thing necessarily. Um, so uh, the bottom line is the, the money supply, um, uh, it's more complicated than what we saw in the quantity theory, right? So um, in the next slide, we'll, we'll look at a, a little bit more detail of what's going to happen, um, how the price level responds when EPI changes. But first, let's look at what happens when R or Y changes. So again, this is all else equal. In order to see the impact of one variable on another, we need to make sure we're keeping everything else constant. So this is just a basic you know, sort of uh, way that we approach a problem scientifically. If we're in a laboratory, we need to um, keep everything the same and then just change one little thing and see how that impacts things. This is no different. So if we want to see how an impact uh, uh, how an increase in y, all else equal, uh, impacts the price level, right? So let's see uh, what's going to happen here. So if y goes up, we know that y goes up, then money demand is going to change, right? So the, uh, the demand of real money balances is going to increase as well. So if the demand for real money balances increases, what we're saying is the right-hand side is getting bigger. So if the right-hand side is getting bigger in order to stay in equilibrium, right, something has to adjust on the left-hand side to make it get bigger as well. So the only way that um, the left-hand side can get bigger if M is staying the same is the price level has to go down. Okay, so the price level must go down to keep this, this uh, system in equilibrium. And so if... if um, this makes sense because if we have more goods and services, Y is getting bigger, right? So this is income, but it's also, you know, equivalent to GDP. So if GDP is getting bigger and the number of dollars floating around the economy uh, is staying the same, if M is fixed, then we have the same number of dollars chasing more goods and services. Well, there just aren't enough dollars, right, to, to maintain the same prices that we had before same number of transactions we had before. So in other words, the, to, for the same amount of money to facilitate more transactions, the prices have to go down. Uh, that's just sort of a, the simple accounting part of this. So if income goes up all else equal, then the price level is going to go down. So what's going to happen to R? So remember, if R goes up, then the nominal interest rate is going to increase. Um, so remember, uh, the nominal interest rate is R plus E pi. So if R goes up, then the nominal interest rate is going to go up. So what does this do to money demand? So the nominal interest rate is the cost of holding money. So this makes money demand go down. So the right-hand side is getting smaller. Um, so if the right-hand side is getting smaller, then what has to happen to the left-hand side? It needs to get smaller as well for a given value of M. For the left-hand side to get smaller, we need to make the denominator bigger. In other words, the price level must go up. So these are the sorts of things that you should be able to work through and, and make logical sense of as you're looking at these equations. So let's talk about expected inflation just a little bit more and see how these expectations filter into um, 
you know, the, the variables in the current time period. So how, does, how do expectations about the future affect the present? Um, so over the long run, it's true, it's probably true in most cases that uh, expected inflation is equal to inflation on average. So over the long run, we, we might make some mistakes, but they're going to basically balance out. And, um, uh, we're not going to consistently make mistakes, right? We're, we, we learn over time, we, we use past information and, um, you know, relatively efficiently. And so we're going to be able to figure out the game eventually and our expectations are going to be pretty close to, to uh, the actual inflation. And in fact, the Federal Reserve is trying to create a stable environment um, so that our expectations are pretty similar to the, you know, to the actual expectation. They don't want us to have wildly different expectations because then we're making bad decisions, right? So we're, we're making decisions thinking rate of, infl rate of inflation is going to be one thing and then it turns out to be something different. Um, and so that creates a lot of risk for people that are entering into um, financial contracts and that sorts of thing. And so... We, we, we don't want people to be scared about making decisions uh, about investing in the future. So um, in the short run, though, um, expected inflation is going to fluctuate. So, uh, you know, anytime we get new information, our expectations are going to adjust. So we get some new information about what, what's going to happen to the economy. We think, well, maybe the Federal Reserve is going to change their policy to, to react to this. And so we start thinking ahead. What are they going to do? Um, uh, maybe the Fed makes an announcement, so they are, they like to to you know be very precise with their words and and um, you know let people know what they're gonna do these days more so than in the past because again they want they don't want people to be surprised they want people to to sort of have their expectations aligned with what the Federal Reserve is actually going to do. So even though in the long run expected inflation is going to equal inflation in the short run, uh, expected inflation is going to change when people get new information. So uh, it could be that the Fed makes an announcement, or it could be that you know uh, some world event is happening, and um, we, we think the Fed might respond by increasing or decreasing the money supply. Um, you know there are all sorts of things that can impact our expectations. So an example would be suppose the Fed announces that it's going to increase. Uh, the money supply next year. So it doesn't actually do it yet. It just says, yeah, we're thinking about it. Next year, we're likely to do this. So immediately, uh, since we know there's a relationship between money and prices, more money means more means higher prices, um, people are expecting the price level to be higher next year. So when they're making decisions that uh, you know are going to be impacted over the course of the next year, then they have to factor in the likelihood that the prices will be higher. So, in other words, their expectations about inflation have changed. Expected inflation rises um, when the Fed just announces this, right? Assuming that the Fed is, is credible, assuming that people believe the Fed is going to do what they say they're going to do. So, this affects the price level now, right? Even though the money supply hasn't changed yet. Um, it, it, so, the, the bottom line, the big lesson here is that the price level is determined by current money, but also, right? expected future money, future money growth. Right? So um, you, you have this, uh, this, this role for expectations now. So uh, what people think is going to happen actually influences variables today. So if you think about that too hard, that'll make your head explode, right? So sort of self-fulfilling prophecies and that sort of thing. So let's run through the logic here quickly to see what happens when expected inflation changes. So again, these are the things I expect you to be able to do to do something changes in this model, you know, explain what the implication is for the other variables. So again, we have to hold everything else constant. So for given values of R, Y, and M, what happens when E pi changes? So if expected inflation goes up, we know that that's a component of the nominal interest rate. So if expected inflation goes up, nominal interest rate increases. This is what we call the Fisher effect. So remember, uh, there's an inverse relationship between the nominal interest rate and money demand. So if interest rates are higher, we want to hold less money because it's, it's more costly to do so in terms of opportunity cost. So money demand goes down. That means this right-hand side of the equation has gone down. So how would we make the left-hand side go down? Well, the price level has to rise. So the denominator of this fraction gets bigger 
the entire fraction gets smaller. So the price has to rise to, to reestablish equilibrium between real, supply of real money balances and the demand of real money balances. So in terms of the costs of inflation, the social costs of inflation, I'm going to let you guys read this. It's pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not going to go through all of this in the video. Um, but do, do read that carefully. So, um, you know, there, there are a lot of misconceptions out there. So, uh, you know, a big one is like a typical person would say, well, what's the problem with inflation in the long run? And they say, well, it makes me poor. Things are getting more expensive. But if it's a true inflation over the, in the long run, wages are rising also. So if, if all prices are rising this, in, the, in, this, in, this, in a similar fashion, um, then you're not left any worse off if there's inflation, right? So your wages are higher to compensate you. Um, in the short run, of course, this can change because your wages might be stuck in a, in a certain you know, spot and prices could rise. And so you know, if you're in a contract that says you know, you're going to be paid 20000 next year and all of a sudden you know, prices skyrocket, then you're going to have less disposable income or you know, your purchasing power is going to be de decreased next year. There's no question about that. So read through those carefully. That definitely could be something on an exam. Note that there's a difference between uh, expected inflation and unexpected inflation. The types of costs associated with those things are different. So make sure you have a good handle on that portion of the chapter. And the last thing I want to touch base on in this portion of the video is the uh, classical dichotomy. So this is kind of putting this all together. What are the, what are the theoretical implications of what we just talked about? Um, so... Remember, we talked about the difference between real variables and nominal variables. So real variables are measured in physical units. So this is the, the actual st how much stuff are we producing. So we're producing 20 cars and 15 haircuts and that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, so real GDP is the quantity of stuff we're producing. The real wage is how much we earn in terms of the output that is being produced, right? So, you know we're working a shoe factory we're being paid in terms of how many shoes are we being paid right that's a real wage um, the real interest rates very similar the output earned in the future by lending one unit of output today so all of these things are in physical quantities nominal variables uh, in contrast are measured in dollars they're they're measured in money units so the nominal rate, the wage, as opposed to the real wage, we don't get paid in shoes, we get paid in dollars. So how many dollars do we get paid per hour of work? That's our nominal wage. The nominal interest rate, these are the dollars earned in the future by lending $1 today. Uh, the price level, so this is the number of dollars needed to buy uh, a certain amount of goods and services. Uh, so all of these things, again, are measured in dollars. So the classical dichotomy refers to this idea that there is a separation between nominal and real variables, right? That's the dichotomy here, is that there's a separation. Nominal variables do not impact real variables. Um, so, so increasing the money supply should not affect real GDP, the real wage, the real return to capital. These things are determined as we saw in chapter three by the marginal products of capital and labor and the, you know, the, the resources that we have in our economy, in other words. So what we say then is that in the long run, money is neutral, right? Money is neutral. And when we say money is neutral, another way to say this is that uh, it's the theory of money neutrality. Uh, so if we increase money, in the long run, it does not have any impact on real variables like real GDP, the real wage, the real return to capital, that sort of thing. Um, and so empirical evidence is, has been somewhat mixed on this. Um, so it's, it's, in the long run, it's a, it's a pretty good approximation, although there is some evidence that increasing money does have long-run effects uh, in some cases and, and for some countries and some time periods. As a general rule, it's a good approximation. Just to reiterate, we are talking about the long run here. In the short run, um, changes in money can absolutely have an impact on real variables. We just expect those impacts to dissipate over time so that in the long run, there's no change in uh, you know, things like real GDP and real wages and, and uh, the return to capital. Well, that wraps up the video for part two of chapter five. So let me know if you have any questions. Happy to make more videos if needed. So let me know if you have any trouble solving problems and that sort of thing. Um, 
you know, the sooner the better so I can get resources out to you. Thanks.